How's it going guys, Cheesy Cats here, and welcome to what is probably the most awaited video so far on the channel. I've been receiving tons of requests for not only a guide on all the 4 star characters, but also a guide on how to team build and fill holes in the roster. I was originally just going to upload a video about just the 4 stars, but I figured that because these 4 star units are what you guys are going to be using to fill out your teams, I might as well combine both of them into one video. So. Without further ado, let's begin by first addressing how many 4 stars there are in the base game. There are 32 in total, 4 in each of the 8 classes, and we'll be taking a look at each and every one of them today. Obviously that's a lot of units to look at, so I'll be putting timestamps in the description and pinned comment so you can easily find whatever units or classes you need. Also, just as a quick disclaimer before we jump in, I'm not going to be going over every single aspect of every single character, but the stuff that I do mention are the things that I feel are the most important and thus are worth bringing up when evaluating that character. Now then, let's get right into the evaluations, going through each class in order, starting with Warriors. At the top of the Warrior class is Sigrid. She's a fantastic offensive unit with access to 3-hit sword and 2-hit lightning attacks, making her reliable for multi-hitting in either attack type. Apart from those, for the third slot I'd usually take her 1 hit sword AoE. Additionally, her 3 star passive applies 3 turns of 15% sword defense down to all enemies at the start of every fight, allowing her and any other warrior allies to deal even more damage. She's a reliable attacker even if she's the only sword unit you bring along, but actually scales even better in developed rosters once you gain more warriors and start specializing your teams to combat enemies that are weak to swords. The extra 15% sword defense down from her passive combined with an entire front row of powerful warriors can eventually make certain fights trivial. Right behind Sigrid is Trish. Like Sigrid, she has access to 3 hit sword, but she gets it earlier at just her 2 star board compared to Sigrid's 3 star board. Additionally, her 3 star sword is slightly weaker but has a much lower SP cost at 25 compared to Sigrid's 38. Which, when you also account for Trish's self regen skill and self heal passive, can make her better suited for longer encounters compared to Sigrid. Trish also has access to a 220 power wind nuke and a single target heal, but because warriors typically have the lowest magic stats out of any of the classes in the game, I wouldn't expect either of these to be too powerful. They're definitely good options to have around though. Next up is Miles. Miles represents the defensive side of the warrior class. On the offensive side, he's fairly limited, with only a 2 hit sword as opposed to Sigrid and Trish's 3 hit skills, and his light options are quite limited as well. However, he has skills that attack the enemy while simultaneously increasing his own physical defense, on top of further buffs that increases defense and magic defense at the same time. While he's at full HP, all enemies are automatically taunted to Miles, so if you can keep him healthy, he can take up to one hit for his allies each turn. Finally, his 1 star passive gives 15% bonus defense up to the ally in front of him, so he can be an amazing unit when paired with a tank such as Gilderoy or Devon, or you can even just pair him with one of your more frail units to give them a little bit of extra durability. Finally, we have Tahir. I think most would agree Tahir is the weakest 4 star warrior. On the offensive side, he has 2 hit sword, which he doesn't even unlock until his 4th board, and only 1 fire ability on his entire kit, which is a weak 130 power nuke. He has access to a self attack buff, as well as an interesting 3 star passive, which gives 2 turns of 20% sword damage up to Tahir and the ally in the same row, every time Tahir swaps. In a hypothetical team where Tahir is your only warrior, you aren't able to get full value out of it, but Tahir is still able to give himself some free buffs. That being said, he doesn't have particularly powerful skills with which to utilize that attack buff to its full potential. Later on, when you have a more developed roster and are incentivized to run a lot of warriors, Tahir's buffing passive can actually come in quite handy for boosting the power of some of your stronger warriors, such as Fior. Next up we have the Merchant class, starting with Devon. Devon is basically Gilderoy Jr. He has an AoE taunt that also buffs his own defense and magic defense, as well as a counter stance, exactly the same as Gilderoy. He also has two very strong passives given his tank roll. One gives him bonus defense for the first three turns of combat, and the other regens some of his health for free every turn, which I should hardly have to explain is amazingly helpful for staying alive while tanking. On the offensive side, he gains access to 2 hit spear fairly early on at his 2 star board, and has access to a couple of wind skills as well. If you're looking for a budget tank, Devon's your boy. Up next is Barad, who is an offensive powerhouse amongst the 4 star merchants. He has access to the only 3 hit spear attack amongst all merchants available on release, and also has an extremely powerful 220 power spear nuke, which he gains at his 4 star board. 
Additionally, he also has a powerful passive that gives both himself and the ally in the same row three turns of 15% bonus attack up at the start of every battle, making both himself and his partner hit even harder. Even when fighting enemies that don't have spear weakness, the attack bonus granted by his passive is still helpful for allowing his row partner to take down enemies, so Barad is a great merchant to keep on your roster if you want to go for a more aggressive approach. Next is Helga. Helga is a bit of a mixed bag and doesn't really have a clear role, but the individual pieces of her kit are pretty decent. Her best spear option is a 2-hit random target skill that also inflicts 2 turns of speed down per hit, and she also has access to 2-hit ice on her 4th board, giving her decent multi-hit options on both the physical and elemental sides. She has the same auto-taunt passive as Miles, allowing her to soak up a hit for her allies as long as she's at full HP, and her other passive reduces all enemies' attack by 15% for 3 turns at the start of each battle. While this is definitely a bit of an oddball kit, Helga is a character that I would gladly bring along if I needed an early spear user. Also, as I went over in my 5-star guide, she has a pretty interesting synergy with Viola that allows her 2-hit spear to inflict 6 turns of speed debuff instead of the normal 4, since Viola increases debuff durations by 1 turn. Finally, we have Pia. Pia is the other 4-star merchant with access to an AoE taunt like Devon. However, unlike Devon, whose taunt is attached to a defense buff, Pia's taunt applies 15% attack up to your entire front row when used. This duration also increases when boosted, so you can potentially taunt the entire enemy team for 5 turns, while also boosting your party's attack for 5 turns with just a single use. Unfortunately, due to Pia's hilariously low speed, you likely won't be able to make use of the attack boost, nor the taunt until the turn after it's been casted. On the offensive side, her options are a bit limited, with a 2-hit spear unlocked at 4-star, and weak light options, but one other skill stands out in her kit, her ability to inflict 15% spear defense down. This becomes more useful as your roster becomes more developed in a similar way to Sigrid's passive. If your entire attacking force is full of merchants, Pia's debuff can let the entire team do a ton more damage. Also, as one final note, Pia's special ability, when it eventually comes out, is actually one of the strongest buffs in the entire game, and she will see use in compositions much further down the line as a result. Also, she's very cute and must be protected at all costs. Next we have the Thieves, starting with Kles. Kles isn't a particularly exciting unit, but he certainly gets the job done. With access to 2-hit Dagger, 2-hit Shield Crack Dagger at 4-star, and a Dagger Nuke that also inflicts defense down, you have a lot of great options that make Kles suited to pretty much any fight. Unfortunately, his Lightning options are extremely limited, with just a 130 power skill, so you'll want to look elsewhere for Lightning-based characters. I'd honestly rather attack with a 2-hit Shield Crack and bring a bunch of solid Dagger options than bring his Lightning skill. Kles's passives give him a bit of bonus attack at the start of battle, and when he's at 50% or lower HP, which can sometimes come in handy. Overall, Kles is a welcome addition to any team. Up next is Wingate, a fan favorite. Wingate actually sees a lot of use as a support backline unit due to his passive, giving the ally in the same row plus 20% bonus damage against broken enemies. However, he's no slouch himself. He has access to a 2-hit dagger attack, 1-hit single target shield crack, and 1-hit AoE shield crack, but I'd actually argue he's more suited to dark attacks than dagger, with access to 2-hit dark single target and AoE. If you're looking for a unit to take care of dark weaknesses, Wingate might be the unit for you. Kurtz is often regarded as the budget viola, since he has immediate access to anti-attack. He's not the most fantastic offensive unit, but he has a lot of great utility options that make him suited to pretty much any fight. One hit Shield Crack Dagger makes him always relevant for lowering shield points, he can reduce enemies' speed or wind defense down with a couple of his nukes, and even has a single target heal. Overall, Kurtz is a great unit to have, especially if you don't have Viola on your squad. While I'm on the subject of Kurtz, I also want to give mention to a couple of strong 3-star thieves, Feline and Diego. These two have access to Attack Down and Defense Down skills respectively, and they actually have multiple of these debuff skills on each of their kits, allowing you to stack the values. For example, Diego has a skill that applies 10% defense down and another skill that applies 15% defense down. By using both of them on the same enemy, you can reduce their defense by 25% total. Feline can do the same but to the enemy's attack stat. I'm gonna have a video later on covering the intricacies of buffs and debuffs, so look out for that. Finally for the Thieves we have Aslite, who's actually just a Scholar in disguise. For Dagger options, she has 2-hit Dagger and 1-hit Shield Crack Dagger, which are fairly typical. However, her expertise is Ice Magic and debuffing enemies' ice defense, making her an excellent companion to Sophia. 
She has access to 3 hit random target ice, a 1 hit ice nuke that heals her for a percentage of the damage dealt, and not one, but two ways to debuff the enemy's ice defense. The first is through a skill, which lowers their ice defense by 20%. The other is through her passive. When Aslight breaks an enemy, she inflicts 15% ice defense down for two turns. Since she's a thief and has naturally high speed, this makes it extremely easy for her to be the one initiating a break and setting up Sophia to do massive amounts of ice damage afterwards. It's worth noting that despite Aslight's passive giving both herself and her row partner 20% ice damage up, you do not want to put her in the same row as Sophia, as she already buffs her own ice damage by 30% with her passive, which is the hard cap. Rather, you want to keep them separate so they can both barrage the enemy with ice skills together. If ice is your thing, Aslight's your go-to girl. Up next are the Apothecaries, starting with Shelby. I'm just gonna get this out of the way now, Shelby is the best 4-star Apothecary, and it's not even close. She's the only 4-star or lower Apothecary that has access to 3-hit Axe, which she gains on her final board. On the Elemental side, she just has a 160 power nuke, which is passable. She has a fairly strong single target heal available from level 1, which I bring along anyways, and finally she has two status removal skills that can remove Paralyze and Weaken status. Usage of these status removal skills is honestly pretty rare, so for the most part, I would just stick to the 3 hit axe, 1 hit ice, and heal. Additionally, she has a free regen passive, handy for keeping her healthy in fights, so she can use her heal on other allies instead. After Shelby is Rodion, who is the other 4 star axe with a multi hit skill. However, Rodion's a bit weird in that it's got a really high damage multiplier of 2x115, and on top of that can inflict a bleed debuff. Throw that on top of his passive that gives him 20% axe damage up while at full HP, and Rodian could potentially do a lot of damage with this skill. The downside of all of this is that the high damage and debuff cause this skill to be extremely expensive SP-wise, so it's not the kind of skill that you can reliably spam turn after turn. Outside of this, his kit's pretty ordinary looking, with 1 hit axe AoE, 1 hit dark single target, a light defense buff, and a single target regen. For newer players, Bleed can do some pretty chunky damage, but in the later stages of the game its damage will fall off, and it instead acts as an enabler for more damage. Some units have a passive that gives bonus damage against bleeding enemies, and unfortunately, Rodion is not one of those units, so the usefulness of the Bleed falls off heavily over time, unless you're playing him alongside those units that have the passive. Overall, I would try not to use Rodion as a primary axe unit in general comps, and instead bring him in for a more specialized comp where the enemy is weak to axes. That way, I can have other units knock the enemy's shield down, and then switch Rodion in to hit the enemy hard once they're in break. Next is Merit, who's another big fan favorite. People use Merit for two main reasons. The first is because she's very pretty, and that's very important. If you want to use your favorite characters all the time, like Maka, go for it. The other main reason to use Merit is for her backline regen passive. While she sits in the backline, the ally directly in front of her gets bonus regen at the end of every turn. This can make Merit a great partner to characters who benefit from having full HP, such as Sophia or Tressa, or tanks who naturally just want to get all their HP back every turn. On the offensive side, her kit isn't super flashy, but she does have access to a decent 160 power axe nuke by default, and eventually gains a powerful 220 power light nuke. She also has a powerful single target heal, which can be helpful in a pinch. Finally, we have Rita. Rita has the least impressive kit of the 4-star Apothecaries in my opinion, with no multi-hit nor high damage skills, and neither of her passives are super noteworthy either. Her highest damage move is her 160 power axe nuke, which is guaranteed to crit, meaning it will do a bit more damage than it would have done otherwise. On the AoE side, her final skill is a 1-hit axe AoE that also restores some of her own HP. Between these two axe skills and her single target heal, that's honestly all she really has going for her. Between all the Apothecaries, they have various skills that can heal and grant immunity to specific debuffs, and some can grant elemental resistances as well. While these can be helpful in niche situations, it's much more important to rate these units based on their overall usefulness, which means looking at parts of the kit that are universally useful, such as their ability to multi-hit or nuke. I would argue the same logic can be applied to Shelby and Rita's passives that give status ailment resistance up. Not every enemy is going to inflict debuffs, and even if they do, they're not necessarily going to be problematic debuffs, so they have fairly little impact on my evaluations of those characters. Alright, we're at the halfway point now, so moving on to the Hunters. 
Coming right off the back of the Apothecaries, we have Camilla, who I personally like to think of as an Apothecary with a bow. She has the same back row healing passive as Merit, and thus has the same synergies with units that want full HP, such as Sophia and Tressa. For her second passive, she increases both her own as well as her row partner's bow damage by 10%. Typically, for a general team, you would like to spread out multiple units of the same damage type, but for hunter-focused teams down the line, this is a pretty nice free boost to Camilla and the unit in the same row. Her main offensive niche is her 2-hit bow AoE, which none of the other 4-star or lower hunters have access to. She also has fire AoE, as well as a 160 bow nuke that inflicts bleeding, but similar to Rodion, she doesn't have any payoff for inflicting bleed within her own kit. On the utility side, she has a single target heal on her 1-star grid, with a stronger one later on for her final skill. Overall, she's a pretty solid unit all around, but is exceptionally useful against multiple enemies who are all weak to bow. Lucetta is regarded by many as the strongest 4-star hunter available on release. With 3-hit bow single target as well as 2-hit ice AoE, she has great multi-hit capabilities on both ends. In addition, she also has access to a 1-hit bow AoE that inflicts 15% defense down on all of the enemies hit. In a way, Lucetta feels like the Sigrid of Hunters in that she's just an extremely solid offensive unit. For her 3-star passive, any buffs that are applied to Lucetta or her row partner get plus 1 turn duration. I don't feel like this unit has any particularly strong interactions. In theory, when paired with Gilderoy or Devon, it can make their defensive buffs from their taunt skills last longer, but they'll often just recast their taunts to increase the duration of the buff themselves anyway. That being said, getting random extra buff duration on any buffs applied to Lucetta or her row partner is always nice. Bertrand is another strong 4-star hunter. He has a 3-hit bow random target as well as a 2-hit lightning random target, which are obviously great in terms of multi-hit capabilities, but also means that Bertrand prefers encounters against a single enemy rather than multiple. The 2-hit lightning attack also has a small chance to inflict paralysis on enemies, one of only three characters currently in the game that have that capability. Bertrand's other powerful kit asset is his Lightning AoE that inflicts 15% Lightning Defense down. When combined with his passive that also inflicts 15% Lightning Defense down, Bertrand can set up powerful Lightning Casters to do lots of damage. While there aren't any particularly strong Lightning users currently in the game, in the near future we will probably see Therese released, as well as eventually the man himself, Cyrus. Bertrand's other passive prevents both himself and his row partner from being paralyzed, which I should hardly have to tell you is a very strong passive for specific fights. If you've ever played a Pokemon game in your life, I shouldn't have to tell you that being paralyzed sucks. Finally, we have Ashlyn. Ashlyn's kit is fairly simple, if not a bit on the weaker side. His main multi-hit option is a 2-hit bow random target that has the chance to inflict poison. Like bleed, poison damage may be respectable early game but falls off hard later on, and also becomes an enabler for bonus damage on certain future units. Ashlyn's overall gimmick is crit, having skills that can deal guaranteed critical hits, buffs that increase all front row allies' critical hit chance, and a passive that increases crit damage by 20% for both himself and his row partner. This makes his personal damage fairly respectable, and I'd probably place him in a similar role to Rodion in the Apothecaries. Before we move on to the clerics, there is actually one 3 star unit that I'd like to highlight, and that is Vivian. Vivian is an amazing low rarity unit, as she starts with 3 hit random target bow by default. The SP cost can be a bit high for early stages of the game, but as long as you're managing SP properly and swapping your units in and out of the back row, this shouldn't be too much of a problem, and her multi-hitting ability can become a powerful asset should you lack some of the higher rarity hunters that we just looked at. Next we move on to the clerics, and there's a lot to talk about here. Ramona is the overall best recommendation for 4-star clerics in my opinion, as she comes with a full front row heal by default, and gains a stronger one upon reaching her 3-star board. She also has access to a full front row magic defense up buff. On the offensive side, she doesn't have access to any multi-hit, but she does have a perfectly usable 160 ice nuke from right off the bat, and eventually also gains access to a 1-hit ice AoE and 1-hit staff AoE. Ramona also has two very useful passives, Every turn she gains 5 SP, allowing her to keep her SP total up to continue healing, and she also has the same backline regen passive as Merit and Camilla, giving her the same synergies there as well. Menno is one of two regen casters within the 4-star clerics, alongside Cedric. Early on, he only has a single ally heal, but it's decently strong. Later on, he gains access to a skill that both heals and grants regen to the entire front row. One important thing to note about skills that both heal and grant regen 
is that boosting them does not increase the duration of the regen like it would on a skill that only applies regen and doesn't heal. Instead, boosting it only increases the potency of the heal. On the offensive side, Menno is a pretty good win support, with 2 hit wind random target that also inflicts 2 turns of speed down per hit, as well as an AoE wind defense down debuff. Additionally, he also inflicts 15% wind defense down at the start of battle, similar to Sigrid and Bertrand. Cedric is the other regen caster. Early on, he has a single ally heal and regen skill, and similar to Menno, he eventually gains access to a skill that heals and grants regen to the entire front row. However, his skill is a bit more expensive SP cost-wise since its numbers are larger, so if longevity is a concern, you may want to try out Menno instead for the lower SP cost and longer engagements. Cedric also has access to a fire nuke that inflicts defense down, and staff nukes that have a chance to inflict bleeding on the enemy. Unlike other characters such as Rodion and Camilla, Cedric actually does deal 30% bonus damage against enemies who are bleeding, so consider pairing him up with those units if you want to utilize him more offensively. Additionally, he grants increased ailment duration to himself and his row partner, but just note that this affects status ailments such as bleeding, and not debuffs like defense down. Lastly, we have Madeleine, who is the most offensively inclined of the 4-star clerics. She's the only character in the game at the time of release that has any staff multi-hits, starting with a 2-hit by default and eventually moving up to a 3-hit staff. On the elemental side, she also has access to a decently strong 160 power lightning nuke. For utilities, she has access to single target healing as well as a full front row 15% magic up buff. Clerics attacking physically isn't something that you see very often, as it's a more magic oriented class, but if you need to bonk your enemies a bit, consider bringing Madeline along. Onto the Scholars. Scholars are our main magical DPS characters and often will have a passive that boosts their damage in their specific element. For example, Sophia's passive increases her ice damage by 30%, while all of the 4-star Scholars have a passive that increases the damage of their respective element by 20%. First up, we have everyone's favorite old man, Paradier. Paradier's claim to fame is his Study Foe passive, which you might recognize from Cyrus in the original Octopath. When you enter a battle, Paradier will reveal one unknown weakness of every enemy in the fight, which is a huge quality of life buff for whenever you're running through uncharted territory. Something that players will often do when entering a new area is just get into a fight, reveal weaknesses, run away, get into another battle, and just keep repeating this until all of the enemy's weaknesses in that area have been revealed. This strategy can also be used to reveal the weaknesses of new elite enemies so you can plan for the fight. Now then, on to the actual combat-oriented side, where Paradier is not exactly the most fantastic unit. He has 2-hit fire single target, but it's unlocked extremely late and has a fairly low potency. He also has a 1-hit tome AoE, but no multi-hit. He does have a buff skill that increases his own magic, which can help out his magic damage a bit, as well as additional skills to reveal even more enemy weaknesses. As a quality of life character, Paradier is unmatched, but the other scholars are much more suited for actual combat. Let's take a look at Laura next. Laura is one of the strongest lightning characters available on release, with access to 2 hit lightning, 2 hit tome, a decent lightning nuke, and a tome nuke that can potentially inflict paralysis. She is the third and final character in the initial roster that can inflict paralysis alongside Gilderoy and Bertrand. Speaking of Bertrand, these two units pair extremely well together in lightning compositions thanks to their passives. Bertrand debuffs enemies' lightning defense down, while Laura drops all enemies' magic defense for 3 turns by 15%. This is a useful passive at pretty much every stage of the game, and Laura is often brought along for fast magic comps just because of this passive debuff, even if the enemies aren't weak to lightning or tome. Next is Noelle. Noelle is the strongest wind character available on release, due to both her raw strength as a wind attacker as well as her overall utility. Her 2-hit wind AoE, which she gains at her final board, has a low enough SP cost that it can essentially just be treated as an all-purpose multi-hit, something that can't be said about certain other characters' AoE skills. For her nuking option, she has a powerful 220 potency wind nuke. Unfortunately, she has no tome-related skills, but this is easily made up for with her utility side. She has the single target buff, elemental boost, which increases one ally's magic and magic defense, as well as a single target debuff, Elemental Break, which decreases one enemy's magic and magic defense. To top that all off, she has an AoE wind defense down debuff as well, making her an amazing asset for wind compositions alongside characters like Tressa, Menno, and Kurtz. The hard part might be deciding on which three of her skills to bring, but rest assured knowing that whatever you decide to pick, they'll be putting in work. The final scholar is Heinz, notable for being the best dark attacker currently in the game. 
Two staple options in his kit are his 2-hit Dark Single Target and his 160 power Dark Nuke, both of which are fairly standard but get the job done. For his third slot, you can choose to bring his Magic Self buff or his 1-hit Dark AoE if it fits the fight. Additionally, he gives himself 15% magic up for 3 turns at the start of his fight thanks to his passive. Despite his simplicity, he has the tools to put in work against enemies weak to dark, especially since good dark attackers are so rare with the starting roster. Finally, we get to the dancers, who all serve completely different roles from one another. Let's start with Iris and Fabio, since they're basically polar opposites of one another. Iris is a physically inclined attacker, with 3 hit fan random target and a strong 170 power fan AoE as her nuking option. She also has access to a 1-hit Ice AoE on the Elemental side. For her main buff, she can increase the attack of all front row allies by 15%. And as for her passives, she gets 20% fan damage up while at full HP, and also gains 15% attack up for the first 3 turns of combat. As it's pretty hard to make solid teams based around elements this early into the game, bringing Iris for her ability to buff physical teams can be quite strong. On the other hand, Fabio is a magic-based attacker. He has a very similar kit to Iris, just based around his magic rather than his physical attacks. 3-hit wind random target, 175 power wind AoE, and a party-wide 10% magic buff. He also has access to 2-hit fan single target, making him a pretty versatile unit for knocking down enemies' shields. His passives are basically the same as Iris's as well, giving him 20% wind damage up while he's at full HP, and 15% magic up for the first 3 turns of combat. Fabio is another excellent wind unit that you could potentially bring along with the same units we went over earlier when talking about Noel. Whereas both Iris and Fabio are basically full offense units, Mabel is more of an all-rounder. Her buff skills let her augment various stats across the entire team, from magic to magic defense and even wind defense. Additionally, she has a fan AoE attack that inflicts 10% magic defense down. While she doesn't have any fan multi-hit skills, she does have a very strong 2-hit lightning attack with 115 base power, making her a great unit to bring for enemies weak to lightning, especially alongside Laura and Bertrand. Both of her passives apply to both herself and her row partner. They enjoy 1 turn reduced debuff duration as well as 1 turn increased buff duration, the second of which is the same passive as Lucetta. Also, I'd like to take a quick second to apologize to the people in the Discord whom I told Mabel and her row partner had increased durations of the buffs they casted as opposed to the buffs they received. I'm just dumb and can't read my own spreadsheet. The last 4 star we have is Mina. Mina is a much more support inclined dancer with defensive buffs and healing. Mina is the only non cleric character currently in the game with an AoE heal, which gives her a lot of inherent value, especially considering it gets boosted by 10% due to her passive. She also comes with multiple full front row defense buffs, one that buffs for 15% and one that buffs for 10. You can cast both of these back to back to buff the entire front row's defense by 25% for several turns. On the offensive side, Mina has a 2 hit fan single target with a very high 115 base power, which can be kind of a downside actually as it makes the ability cost much more SP. Apart from that, she has a 145 base power light AoE as her strongest light attacking option, with her second passive boosting her light damage while she's at full HP. Now that we've looked at every single 4 star available, let's move on to talking about how I team build, as this has easily been one of the most requested things on the channel. I'm going to be explaining my thought process for general play, as in just running around, basically playing blind, without organizing a specific team to combat specific enemies. Before we get into any actual composition building, let's first address Paradier. As I mentioned before, Paradier is an amazing unit for quality of life since he reveals enemy weaknesses upon entering battle. If you need a tome unit for just going through the motions, Paradier is a great choice to bring along, but ultimately he is just a weaker combat unit compared to other scholars overall. Now on to the actual team building. The first thing I look at is the class variety. If you're going wide with your classes, you have more opportunities to strike enemy weaknesses. That being said, it's not mandatory to have all 8 classes, and having 7 or even 6 is completely fine if it means playing a better overall unit. I'd much rather double up on Thieves, running Viola and Kurtz for example, rather than running Jorge. Basically, the goal here is to be ready to fight enemies no matter what their weaknesses are. For that reason, having a Shield Crack Thief can also be quite effective, since they're effective against any enemy. In order to make sure you don't have dead lanes, that is, an entire lane that can't address any enemy weaknesses, it's recommended to avoid putting two characters of the same weapon type in the same row, at least if you're playing blind and don't know what you're fighting against or what their weaknesses are. I know it can be tempting to go for a Fior Tahir lane or a Lynette Mabel lane as they have great synergy, 
But if you aren't able to hit any enemy weaknesses, then what exactly is that lane doing? It's like you're playing Pokemon and your Water-type Pokemon has Surf, Hydro Pump, Scald, and Waterfall, and you're going up against a Grass-type. You want to keep your options open. Securing a decent healer is a pretty high priority as well. Obviously, Teo and Millard can get the job done, but what if you don't have either of them? Ramona, Cedric, Menno, and Mina are the go-to healers in the lower rarities. All four of these characters have access to team-wide healing at some point in their kit. Ramona has it available the earliest, followed by Mina, and then finally Cedric and Menno with their heal and regen skills. One question that I get asked a ton is something along the lines of, I re-rolled and got Viola and Lynette 5-star, but I don't have any of the healers you listed, what do I do? In this situation, it becomes more important to prioritize some healing over a bit of combat proficiency. Some units that have single target healing available from an early level are Shelby, Rita, Merritt, Camilla, and Kurtz. Notably, Merritt and Camilla also have their back row regen passives to help out with the healing even when they're on the back line. Another thing to look out for in this case would be attack debuffers to reduce the amount of incoming damage. Attack debuffers apart from Viola include Kurtz, Feline, and to a lesser extent, Helga with her passive. One more strategy that you can look into is running a tank. Gilderoy and Devon are both fantastic tanks that each have some sort of regen in their kit. By buffing up their defense and putting additional regens on them, they can single-handedly serve as a one-man damage sponge. Alright, that about covers everything that I wanted to talk about today with regards to the 4-star roster and team building. This one took quite a bit to get done, so I really hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to put them down in the comment section below. Coming up next, I have a few ideas of what I want to upload next on the channel, but I'm not sure what order I'm going to put them in quite yet. In particular, some of the stuff I want to put up are an in-depth look at hunts, as well as a more extensive look at buffs and debuffs, as well as that video on Lynette that I've been bringing up here and there. I guess we'll just have to see which I decide to go with first. So, until next time, this has been Cheesy Cats. See ya!